Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dylan. Tremendous truth and song. And don't miss this, my friend. God loves you and Jesus died for you. Don't let that ever get old. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, I know that we're all sinners. The Bible tells us that we can trust Jesus Christ today. And so we won't want you to leave the service here without putting your trust in Jesus Christ. And my friend, if you've been saved for 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, don't forget the fact that God looked beyond your fault and saw your need. All right, that song ought to humble us and cause us to have thanksgiving gratefulness in our heart. If you have your Bibles open to Psalm chapter number 85. Psalm 85. This Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we have revival here at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. We call it revival because we have revival services. We're praying that God gives us revival at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. And Monday night at 7 o'clock p.m. and Tuesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. we'll have services right here. With the hope and the prayer that God will touch us and that God will, will change us. That God will do something that, that we can't do and this morning, I, wanna, I want to answer the question, why revival? Why revival? You see, we could, we could say, well, pastor, we have really busy lives. So why are you going to schedule revival services? I get it. We do have really busy lives. There is always, it seems, something to be done something that will need to be done, and when that's done, something else will then be on its plate to be done. We have busy lives. Those who maybe are retired at this stage in life, I've heard from you often that you're at just as or even busier now than when you worked full-time. We have busy lives. Maybe some would argue perhaps too busy, but it's what we're called to, what we're called to. I think one of the things we saw through March and April with the shutdown in Michigan is that it was nice, at least I viewed it to be nice, to have a lot of time with my family. Now, they did say that divorces were up, things like that, so maybe not everyone viewed it the same way that I did. <laughs> That's not good. But we're busy people. There was a great evangelist years ago by the name of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday would go and he would preach evangelistic and revival campaigns and crusades. He would go into a town and preach, and there were times he would preach for a week or two weeks or even longer than that every single night. There were times he would preach all day long and at night. He'd preach. And a lady once came to Billy Sunday, and she asked this question to, to evangelist Billy Sunday, why do you keep having revivals when it doesn't last? Why do you keep having revivals when it doesn't last? Billy Sunday gave a tremendous response. He gave a response in the form of a question. Now, it's never nice to answer a question with, an, with a question, right? But Jesus did that in the Bible, so I guess we can borrow from that sometimes. And this lady asked evangelist Billy Sunday, why do you keep on having revivals when it doesn't last? And he asked the lady this question, well, why do you keep on taking baths? Just let that sink in for a moment. Tomorrow morning we wake up, we take a shower, a bath, or tonight, think of that. Because just by living, sometimes we get dirty. If you would turn your attention, please, to Psalm 85, beginning in verse number 1, where the Bible says, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to the, his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. 
Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. Question this morning, why revival? Or better asked, why not revival? Lord, I pray you'd help us in these next few moments. Lord, I can't begin to communicate your truth in any way without your spirit and its help. Lord, I pray you'd help me now as I speak. Lord, may I say those things that would be pleasing to you. Lord, I'd ask that there would be no distractions in the service, that our hearts would be turned towards you and towards your word and your spirit. Lord, I pray again for not only this morning and this afternoon service, but this coming Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, our revival services. Lord, would you touch us? We crave your touch. Lord, would you change us? And Lord, I pray that there's anyone here who's not trusted you as their Savior, they'd do that today. They would not leave without that question answered in their soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Why revival? I mentioned to the men this, or when they asked me about what to put on the screen. Not, nothing else what I say will be on the screen today, just that question, why revival? So that hopefully if you get nothing else from the service this morning, and I hope you get something else, but if you get nothing else that will answer this question, why revival? And why not revival at First Baptist Church? You could say, Pastor, why? Because we're busy. Or, or why? We already come to church. Why do we need revival? Well, we need revival, I think, for a few reasons that I want to share this morning of what happens to many of us, if not all of us. Gypsy Smith, another evangelist, when someone was asking how to pray for revival, he said this. He said, you ought to go home. He said, take a piece of paper and draw a circle on a piece of paper around you and then pray for revival for everyone in the sight of that circle. We live in a time that this world needs Jesus Christ. You can't go very far. You can't watch very much. You can't hear very much but not realize that this world, this country, this nation needs revival. It needs the touch of God. This state, the state of Michigan, needs the touch of God. It needs revival. This city, Saginaw, Michigan, needs revival. This town, Bridgeport, needs revival. This church needs revival. This pastor needs revival. You see, when we come to revival, it is not that we come and say, oh, I am just fine. I'm doing pretty good. When we're met with the God of the universe, we cannot help but walk away humbled and challenged and hopefully changed. You see, it's possible to come face to face with God and not be. Read the Gospels. Many people came face to face with the Son of God. Jesus Christ was his, is his name. And they walked away from that. And you can come to revival. You can come to church. You can come to where God is at. And you can stay the way you are. Why revival? This morning, I want to present a couple reasons why we need revival. The first is become we can become cold and calloused. We can become cold and calloused or insensitive to the words of God. We can become insensitive to the very preaching of God. L listen, I can sit through a service and I sat here for 17 years under Pastor Lett. What a tremendous man and mentor and preacher. And yet if you're not careful and I'm not careful, I could sit in the service and while I'm sitting there, I'm saying amen at the right time, my mind is a hundred or a thousand. It might as well be a million miles away. Does that happen to anyone else in here or is it just me? Is it just me? You're like, yeah, with you, Pastor, you put us to sleep. Sure, that's fair enough, fair enough. It is, unfortunately, very easy to become insensitive to the words of God. You know what can distract me at church? Yes. Yes. Lunch. Did you walk in and smell the food we're going to eat in a few minutes? Anybody else smell that this morning? 
How many thought it smelled good this morning? Yeah. Pastor Scott, please, don't like open the fan and put it down the hallway. You're killing me, man. You know, seal those doors up. And if we're not careful, even that, and it doesn't matter what it is, but if it distracts us, if it causes us to become insensitive to the words of God, we become cold and calloused. Last Sunday, it was bitter out. Snow seemed like sub zero temperatures. In fact, it was like maybe 28 with wind chill, maybe a little bit colder. But it seemed a whole lot worse. This week, beautiful, right? Man, I could get used to this in Michigan, but I won't because it's Michigan, right? Last week I was outside for a little bit, and it seemed like outside, I was outside for about an hour or so, boy, the hands became numb, right? You know this, you live in Michigan. You come back in, and when your hands, your fingers are numb, you can like tap things, right? You can't feel it. Are my hands still there? Uh, 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 yeah. I, they look like they're there, and I can vaguely feel some thumping, some thumping, but it's insensitive. They're cold. We need revival because if we're not careful, our hearts become insensitive. And as the words of God are preached, as we read God's word, as we spend time with him, if we're not careful, we feel the thumping. Something's there, but it's numb. It's numb. I hear what you're saying, Pastor, and, and I like it, but... Oh, well. Hey, it was a good thing I read this morning, and well, well, how did it affect you? I don't know. Just there. Boy, that was, a, that was a neat illustration you used, and well, did it affect you? I don't know. Insensitive to the words of God. How quickly we become insensitive to the words of God. Do you ever find yourself insensitive to the words of God? I think if you're going to be honest, if I'm honest, we have to say, yeah. We become cold and callous. We're insensitive to the words of God. We're indifferent to the working of God. We're indifferent to the working of God. Someone will trust Christ and get saved. And there would have been a time where we're like, man, praise the Lord. This is great. Can you believe that? After a while, what happens? Huh. That's neat. Huh. Nice. Where before, we'd be jumping all over the place and we'd be going back and forth and telling everybody now it barely, it barely gets a finger. Eh, that's nice. Eh, mm, maybe two. Wow. You're different to the working of God. But listen, my friend. Listen, fellow Christian. Don't ever become indifferent to what God is doing in your life and in my life. Don't miss what he's doing here at the church and in this town. Don't miss what he's doing in the world. God is working. You see, what once brought joy now seems less impressive. What once was life-changing is now seemingly commonplace. This happens throughout life and various degree, varying degrees and with different circumstances. So for a while, I had a motorcycle. I remember the first time I sat on that bike and started it. It wasn't the fastest bike on the road. It was just a CBR 600, but it would go 0 to 60. They say it would go 0 to 60 in about 2.6 to 2.7 seconds. I don't know if it would do that or not. It seemed to take about 15 seconds. <laughs> Remember the first time I sat on that bike and turned that on? Took that throttle, cranked that throttle. Now you shouldn't do that before it's warmed up. But sometimes I got a little impatient. Sometimes. First time I drove that bike on the road. I'm going down the road and I'm like, man, I must be flying. I'm only going 45 miles an hour. And I was flying so fast, so fast. Who would go beyond 45 on a motorcycle? That's right. That is right. Do you remember on that bike, the first time I was at a stoplight, I was like, you know what? One thing I don't want to do, I don't want to stall the bike at the stoplight. There is nothing more embarrassing than for a motorcycle rider than to stall at a stoplight. And if you ever see somebody, you might as well just look at them and shake your head. <laughs> but after a while, 45 was 
45. There was nothing when you went 50. You know? <laughs> they call it the law of diminishing returns. And if we're not careful, as we come to spiritual things and the working of God, we become cold and callous, and the things that once, boy, just really fired us up, the things that once God is excited, it's a good song, or the blessing of God, a praise, an answer to prayer, after a while, if we're not careful, we become indifferent to the working of God. Don't miss what God is doing. I still each morning in my devotional journal write down blessings of God. And often I look back at the pages, and I would encourage you, if you've never done this, you ought to do it sometime. It's not the only way to have devotion to spend time with God. It's what I do. But I love looking back to see what God did last week. You know what I find in my life? I don't know about you, but in my life, that I forget. I forget that's right, a week ago God answered this prayer right here. Lord, thank you for doing that. I had forgot about that. And sometimes they would be what we would call seemingly small things. But it's never small when I pray and the God of the universe answers my prayer. That's never small. But in my mind, I say, well, that was just a, a little. Lord, you helped this to turn out well. You, you answered this little need we had. Thank you for doing that. But I love to look back. I don't want to become indifferent to the working of God. And if we're not careful, we become insensitive to the words of God, indifferent to the working of God, and we become impersonal to the worship of God. One of the reasons that we come to church is to worship God at church. Now, you can worship God all of the time. You can worship Him at home. You can worship Him while you drive down the road. But one of the reasons we come to church is to worship God. But sometimes, when people come after they've been to church for a while, worship becomes impersonal, without any personal feeling attached to it. You know what we do, church? Let me help. You know what we do? We sit down and we come in. Now I'll make the camera guys work a little bit. They don't like that very much, but they do a great job. They really do. And the service starts. And almost as if by memory, our legs just work and we stand. And we sing. We're done singing. And without any more thought, what do we do? We sit down. The song happens. The song is done as if by magic what happens. Impersonal. Impersonal. You know that when we sing, we sing in our hearts to the Lord. Amen. To the Lord. We're not singing. You're not singing for me up here. I'm not singing for you. You're not singing for the people around you, though they're affected by that, and you can encourage people around you. You're singing to him why would we want to sing to, the, to our Savior, to the God of the universe like this? And we can sing every song known to man with that same deadpan expression. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. We can sing them all, right? I love to tell the story. Really? Really? Does it not seem a little bit impersonal? A little bit disconnected from what we're supposed to be doing? That maybe, just maybe, what's coming out here ought to come from here? It ought to be an overflow, just not something that we're like a puppet? Impersonal. We become cold and callous because we be become impersonal in worship. I fear that we've forgotten that we're meeting with God himself, that he would deem us worthy to meet with us. This is his idea, not our idea. Where life and sustenance was found now is just mediocrity. We become cold and calloused. We also, though, if we're not careful, we become self-centered and self-serving. We are distracted with our own agenda. 
finishing up our projects, working out our needs, deciding what our wants are, and solving our own problems. We need revival because we're distracted, not with the things of God, but with our own things. Or God's agenda just becomes a passing thought. Soul winning is a good idea. Witnessing is a nice thought. Spending time with God just becomes rote and something I stick in when it is, uh, when I can find the time to do it. But my own things, I make sure that I won't miss my hunting time. I make sure that I won't miss my things. We become distracted. You see, you stayed up to watch the election all night. But you can't come at 7 o'clock on a Monday night. You wouldn't miss work, that's for sure. Church, I got, I got to drive, Pastor. I got to go. Distracted with our own agenda, our own things. Distracted with our own problems, and we worry about our things rather than God's things. What are God's problems? Well, God says the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Distracted. Listen, we all get distracted at times. Why do we need revival? We all get distracted. My problems always seem bigger than your problems. If you break your leg and I stub my toe, you know it hurts me more? My stubbed toe, I feel that differently. It takes some effort to feel and empathize with other people. And if we're not careful, it is natural to worry about our own things and not the things of the Lord. But when we get distracted, we miss God's agenda. We miss his plans. We need revival because we get and we are distracted. We're distanced because of our own appetites. And people say, well, pastor, we don't like the music of your church. It's just too boring. I like fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. I have never been a skinny person. Now, some of you will say, well, pastor, you're, you're so skinny. Fine, whatever, okay? I've told you before, but I was always a larger child growing up. In fact, I didn't know Husky was a dog until I was 21. <laughs> That's where I shopped. I've always worked through like weight issues, running, I've run, I've lifted weights, I still lift weights, and, and diets, and diets. I know most of them. I've tried quite a few of them. You know what my biggest problem is? My mouth. More ways than one, yeah? You say amen, that's fine. I like to eat. I like to start the diet tomorrow. After the holidays, Thanksgiving's coming. You can't diet during Thanksgiving. You can't. No, no, no. That's not even spiritual. You actually can. Hey, you actually can. Not during Christmas. Have you seen those snacks? Yes, that's my problem. The diet always starts next week and next year. All right, we'll go till 2022. That's how far out I am. I read this once, I read this one phrase once. I've been on a diet for 30 days, and I've lost 30 days. <laughs> You know what hinders that is not being consistent, not making the right choices. We get distance from God because of our appetites. Well, Lord, I know I ought to spend time with you, but I'd really like to just flip through Facebook. This seems to me to be a better for my appetite than this over here. For whatever reason, we've got some strange children in our house, probably because of their parents. I have one child who will tip it, or has in the past, wanted to trade out French fries for broccoli at a restaurant. At first, the waitress said, you can't do that. That's what's wrong with America. I'm changing, that's, I'm changing my sermon. That's what's wrong with America. She said, you can't do that. I said, ma'am, right, here's my thought. You can do anything you want for the right price, all right? 
if the kid wants broccoli, I don't care what it costs. Right. They ain't going to have that much money. Well, I can't, I can't try those fries for the broccoli. Can you give them a side of broccoli? Oh, we can do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. But he'll eat broccoli sometimes at a French fries or a salad. That's, that's a weird kid. I know. I know. We enjoy that. And they've learned to enjoy that. You know, some of these things are contagious, parents. You know, they like coming to church partly because Doreen and I like coming to church. We look forward to it. Now, there's things that they, they have wonderful teachers. They're in junior church this morning. Their Sunday school teachers are phenomenal. We are blessed with some tremendous servants of the Lord at First Baptist Church. And you, those who teach children in the classes, you do a phenomenal job. And my kids learn. I ask them, what did you learn? And they tell me. And I don't, I don't let them say just Jesus on the cross, all right? That's like the catch-all answer every Sunday. But no, no, no. What did you learn? And, well, you know, uh, uh, Mrs. Berger taught about this, and Danielle tells me what you taught about. And uh, so if you ever say anything bad about me, she'll tell me. She'll tell me, Mrs. Berger. <laughs> no, she won't, no. But your teachers do a phenomenal job. They're young people. But part of the reason they like coming is because I like coming, and my wife likes coming. It's contagious. If we're moaning and groaning, guess what the kids will do? Moan and groan. And when you come to the church with that attitude, everyone else can see it. Yeah. How you doing? Fine. Oh, come on. But you know what happens? Our appetites. Our appetites shift. Do I like sugar? You better believe it. I've liked it as long way back as I can remember. I didn't have to work on liking sugar. It just happened. Just kind of fell into it. But the first one was free with sugar. The rest, boy, that cost me every step of the way. But about two years ago... I started the keto diet, and I basically cut out sugar from my life, was one thing. People have asked, how did you do that? Well, I just didn't eat it. <laughs> so when it came, I just didn't take a bite. Wasn't that hard? Moments. When my wife was eating it, my kid's like, wow, Dad, this is great. Shut up, kids. <laughs> Give the kids some broccoli. The other day, I had something that was lightly sweetened. I almost, went into, I almost went into convulsions. It was too sweet. I said, oh, this is horrible. Three weeks ago, I sent my son, one of my sons, not the brightest child, for a Diet Coke. He came back. He goes, oh, they didn't have Diet. This is a regular Coke. I thought he was kidding because my kids will kid back and forth. And I took a sip of regular Coke. And I was like, that's different. I took another one. I had a headache in about a, in about a minute. From two sips, just, just to me. You're like, well, why are you that sensitive to, to, to sugar? Because I haven't had it. You know, why, you know why the world still affects you? Because you're still consuming it. You're still taking bites. You're still, you've never put it aside. You, you never put it aside. We become distanced because our appetites. We need revival because we've been chomping on the wrong thing all day long. You wonder why your mind's in left field and your, your heart's racing on a mile out because you've been filling it with worldly appetites and needs and we're distanced because of our appetites and we're deterred because of our actions. You've become self-centered and self-serving. And we've become stubborn and sinful, willfully choosing our own way, willfully combating our own, with our own weapons. Someone said the kingdom of God is not going to advance by our churches becoming filled with men, but by men and our churches becoming filled with God. And though I'd love to see this church packed to the brim with people, I'd rather see the people here packed with God. That's why revival. Look in your Bibles now. We read Psalm 85. Verse number 6, where the psalmist is asking the Lord, Wilt thou not revive us again? Lord, won't you cause us to live again, revive us? Lord, I'm sick of being this way. Lord, I'm, I'm tired of living this way. Lord, this life stinks doing it my own way. Lord, the things I've been consuming, they haven't been fulfilling like you have been in the past. Lord, the worship that I once had, Lord, I miss that. Lord, the, the words that used to grip me now seem to have faded away. Lord, I miss that. Lord, will you not revive us again? 
three statements out of this psalm that I see. He says, Lord, you're able to. Lord, you're able to. It's understood, Lord, wilt thou not revive us again? Lord, you're able to revive us again. I'm not asking one who is not able. I'm not asking one who is not powerful. I'm not asking one who is unable to answer this question. Lord, you're able to revive us again. Lord, will you do that, please? Lord, you're able to. In the psalm, we see from the beginning, Lord, you have been favorable to this land. You have brought back the captivity. You have forgiven the iniquity. Thou hast, thou hast covered. You have covered their sin. Verse number three, thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself. Lord, not only are you able to, Lord, you've done it before. Lord, you've done it before. God has touched people before. So we come into revival, we don't come without any idea what God can do. We come with a request for God. God, you're able to. And God, you've done it before. Lord, you touch us. Touch us here at First Baptist Church. Lord, of course, I pray for the nation. I pray for this town. But, Lord, I'm praying for this place right here, for this congregation right here. Lord, I'm praying for this people right here. Lord, will you touch us? Lord, you're able. You've done it before. And, Lord, you sure are good. I see the result that thy people may rejoice in thee. See, there's always joy when people turn back to God. You're tired of coming to church? You need revival. You're bored with the things of God? You need revival. You're not excited about people getting saved? You need revival. There is always rejoicing when revival comes. We need revival. Revival, newfound life in my spiritual life, newfound joy in godliness, newfound blessings in the things of God. There's rejoicing, and then there's recognition. The end of the psalm, he talks about what he recognizes with God. There's truth, and there's mercy, and there's more truth, and there's righteousness. There's compassion, and there's salvation. There's rejoicing, and there's recognition when revival comes. You see what we don't need? is reformation. Reformation happens on the outside. I can reform someone with their actions. Reform happens out here. Wear this. Do this. Don't do this. What we need is not reformation. We need revival. That happens on the inside. And when it comes from the inside, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. The actions will follow. These things will change. But it has to happen right here. Why not revival? So church, are you in a place that needs reviving? I don't mean a a place, I mean a place. It is simple. It is easy. It is natural to look around. Oh, that person needs revival for sure. And, and my spouse for sure. Miss Doreen, she definitely needs revival. Oh, no doubt about that. And my kids need revival, but me? Me? Yeah. Are you in a place? Am I in a place that needs reviving. Are you in a place where you can receive reviving? You know, you're able to ignore the revival this week. For whatever reason, when God, with his grace to us, gave us the ability to reject him, we can reject it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock with the idea that you don't have to answer the Lord. 
you can reject him. Are you ready for God to touch you this week? I've been praying for this revival. I think looking back as the Lord helped us schedule it, it's the right time for us. Not because I know of some big sin problem as your pastor, of course not. But because sometimes it's like, all right, Lord, we need you again. Lord, do something. Lord, show up. Show up. Lord, show up and we're ready for it. And I'm praying that God will send revival. You know, often at camp, we go to camp. The Lord has seen fit to touch us a few times at camp. I'm so grateful for that. But often at camp, the first night I'll ask the teenagers, the young people, do you already know what God wants to deal with you about? And almost always, hands go up. Usually, we know, already know what we, what God wants to do. That's why I've often said our problem is not typically a knowing problem, it's a doing problem. We usually know what we're supposed to be doing, but we become cold and calloused and indifferent and distant and insensitive and impersonal. Why not revival? I'm praying that God will touch us. But don't wait till tomorrow night. Maybe this morning, God's touched you. In your spirit, in your heart, God has said, you need to now starting to respond to me. Sometimes in revival or camp, it seems like God peels back layers. And he gets through the upper crust, but then there's some other things that he begins to deal with. Let God deal with us thoroughly in the next three days. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the time we have this morning. Lord, I thank you that you're able to touch us and change us. Oh God, we need you. I need you. Lord, we need your touch and revival. One of you here this morning would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Would you pray for me? I need, I need that. Who would say that's me? Just slip your hand and slip back down. Amen. Amen. Who else? That's me. That's me. Pray for me. Lord, touch me, and there's some things that God needs to do in my heart. Who else? Didn't raise my hand before, but I'll raise it now, Pastor. That's me. Amen. Who else? Amen. I wonder if you're here this morning, and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can't be revived because you've never been saved. You've never been revived, given life. But we'd love to open a Bible this morning and show you how you can know for sure that God loves you and Jesus died for you. Would you let me pray for you? Who would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like to be sure. When you were speaking, God touched my heart, and I'm not sure if I die today, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Pray for me when you pray for the others. I drew no attention to them. I'll draw no more to you now. Well, who's that? Just slip your hand up, hand up and slip it back down. I'll see it, and I'll pray for you. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Bless this time of invitation. Lord, as the pianist plays that song, whatever it takes. Lord, may we have that heartfelt, honest desire. Lord, bless this time. Those who have lifted a hand, would you touch them? Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, would they come today, we'd open the Bible and show them. Lord, we sure love you. Lord, bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen.